Shalom, Shalom, Israel. My name is Mori Aliyahu from the congregation of Yashra. Where Mori Kasadaba Yashra is the senior Mori, and I am the executive Mori. Today, I would like to come to you guys with a recording or <clears throat> a teaching on a very important subject matter. Today, amongst our people, being the 12 tribes scattered abroad of the nation of Israel, or Yashra, we seem to be at discord over an important subject matter, and that subject matter is the virgin birth. There are those who believe, and there are many that the virgin birth is a myth or a false teaching. But my goal today is to go to the Old Testament and see and show that it was foreshadowing or pointing towards the virgin birth all of the time. So we will look at this and investigate it and gain understanding from a Old Testament perspective and see if it was giving us hints and clues to not only confirm or have the um, New Testament confirm what the prophets of old already knew. And today, as we go into this, let me see here. Okay. Let's um, look at some things and um, we're going to be using a couple of phrases from the Hebrew language as we read the scriptures. And we're going to gain some understanding from the Hebrew language and how it works and how the rules of grammar when it comes to the Hebrew language, how it plays a part into our understanding of what we read when we're reading scripture. So I often tell people, it's very important, and if you can and have time, even if it's just a few minutes a day, just begin to slowly learn the Hebrew language or biblical Hebrew. And it will greatly increase your knowledge and understanding when it comes to the scriptures. Because I like to show people that oftentimes we're reading the scriptures and we're reading from the English translation only. But there are things in the Hebrew language that you will see because of the language and your understanding of the rules of grammar and how it applies to the language. You will see things that are not necessarily shown because you can't see it because you're reading from an English translation. So what we want to do is just begin to investigate investigate this subject matter of the virgin birth and we're going to use the Old Testament and what we're going to see is it was already pointing us to and showing us the virgin birth all of the time so before we start I want to use one of the seven principles of Hillel and the principle that I want to use is called Gazira Shava. Gazira Shava. And when using Gazira Shava, let's get an understanding of what it is. So Gazira Shava is kind of like, it's an argument from an analogy. It's like comparing two words or comparing similar words in different passages. An analogy is made between the two separate texts on the basis of a similar phrase, word, or root, i.e., where the same words are applied to two separate cases, it follows that the same consideration apply to both. So in other words, you know that oftentimes when we read scriptures and we can read in three different places and we'll see the same phrase. Now, not knowing the seven principles of 
Hallel or scripture inter interpretation, what you will see is that these three phrases or these different phrases in separate places, all of them are connective. All of these phrases are connective. And when we read the different phrases in different chapters and books and verses, the phrases, what they do, and I'm using the number three because um, sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three. And oftentimes you can find even up to four or five phrases in different areas, different uh, books, different chapters and verses. But all of these locations and scriptures that we read when we see the phrases, they are connective threads. It's up to us to begin to search and seek out uh, what the writer is trying to tell us, what the Most High wants us to see in that particular chapter. So when we read and see these phrases, each time, each phrase doesn't always give the same information. Some are limited to what they reveal, but when you go to that phrase on another chapter, it reveals more. And so what we do as the reader using Gazir Rishava, we take all of the different details and we compile them together to get a message to show what the Most High is showing us through his words, through these connective threads. And so what we want to do today, this is um, part one of the virgin birth found in the Old Testament. And so what we want to do is... Let's go over to Isaiah, or Yeshayahu, the seventh chapter, and the 14th verse. Isaiah, the seventh chapter, and the 14th verse. Read as follows. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Behold, a virgin shall shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So when we look at this word Emmanuel, which comes from the Hebrew um, H6005, when we look at that one word and break it down, we have Im, which is with Imanu, which means with us, Emmanuel or Emmanuel mean Yahuwah or Elohim with us. So we have Emmanuel, God with us. So now we're going to go over to Genesis, the 32nd chapter, and the 24th verse through the 30th, 30th verse. So let's pay very close attention to some here. Genesis 32 to 24. Excuse me, hold on. Let me make sure I'm recording. I'm sorry. And I am, okay. Just want to be sure. Okay, Genesis 32, 24 through 30. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled with a man with him until the breaking of day. Jacob wrestled with a man, number one. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaker. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Yashra'al, or Yisrael, or Israel, however you want to pronounce it. For as a prince hath thou power with Elohim, 
and with men and hath prevailed. Now, pay very close attention to verse 29. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore it is that thou, I mean, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. So we see Jacob wrestled with a man. And he changed Jacob's name. Then he asked Jacob his name. And Jacob replied, and he said, No longer should your name be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with Elohim and with men, and hath prevailed. And then it said, and Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray, your name. And the man, wherefore it is, he's asking him, he said, wherefore is it that thou ask my name? He didn't reveal his name to Jacob, but he blessed him. So when we get to that phrase, because this is a phrase that we want to focus on. Why do you ask my name? In Hebrew, that's Lamaze Tishalishmi. Lamaze Tishalishmi. I'm going to say it again. Lamaze Tishalishmi. Why do you ask my name? So we see this phrase in Hebrew. We see this is the first account of somebody wrestling with this particular man. And Jacob asked this man, what was his name? The man replied to ask Jacob, why do you ask my name? Lamaze Tishali Shmi. Okay, remember, we, this is the phrase we want to focus on. Why do you ask my name? Then it said, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, <clears throat> our first encounter, we see Jacob said what? He identified this entity as a man. Now, we read Genesis 32, we get under verse 30, Jacob identifies what he said, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. He said, for I have seen God, or Elohim, face to face, or pani pani, and my life is preserved. So, <clears throat> we see that Jacob identified um, as a man, then he identified the entity as God or Elohim. Okay. So what we see is the message is not revealed in his name because it's not time yet to be revealed. And we have to understand that the name is being concealed for purpose. Then last when we read the Targums, which I know um, very few of y'all probably ever heard of the Targums or read them. When we read the Targum, it's already understood from our forefathers that this angel is the messenger angel or is the messenger or angel of the Lord. So what we see, we should find out here. It's through the ladder of Jacob that the infinite light, which would be the divine father, interacts with the finite matter, which is us. This is how the Most High interacts, being him being divine and infinite, interacts with us being finite matter or individuals. It's through Jacob's ladder that we see that the Most High can interact with his creation. And we're going to go a little deeper into that um, a little bit in the um, lesson. So we see Jacob wrestles with this angel. <clears throat> then
Then we see Jacob call or wrestle, I should say, wrestle with this man. Then we're going to see he's identified as an angel. Then Jacob calls him what? God or Elohim. So let's go read another scripture. We'll go to Judges. And remember the phrase, why do you ask my name? Okay, we're going to go to Judges, the 13th chapter. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is we are going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Then we're going to jump down to verses 17 and 18. Judges 13, verse 1, 2, and 3. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoach, and his wife was barren. And bear not. <clears throat> so that's very important to see right there because we're going to learn as we begin to teach more and more about Hebraic thought and how it works. Let me read that second verse again. There was a certain man of Zorah, Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoach, and his wife was barren and bear not. And the angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord let me find this oh and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman remember this woman was barren and we look up barren if this woman had never brought forth children or she couldn't have children and it's an angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And listen to Manoach when we read verse 17. And listen to the reply that the angel gives Manoach in verse 18. Verses 13, I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse 7. Judges 13, verse 17. Judges 13, verse 17. And Manoach said unto the angel of the Lord, and Manoach said unto the angel of the Lord. What is thy name? That when thy saying come to pass, we may do thee honor. Listen to verse 18. And the angel of the Lord said unto them, uh, unto him, I'm sorry, I'm tripping tonight. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? So we have that question asked again. It was first asked by who? Jacob. And it wasn't revealed. Now we see another thread or the same phrase, let's see if they connect. He said, why ask it my name, seeing it is secret? So we have the angel respond again, Lama Zay Tisha Lishmi. Lama Zay Tisha Lishmi. Why ask it thou after my name? So, but this time, when we get 
to Judges 13 and 8, you notice that something changed? Because each time using Gezira Shava, more detail should come with each phrase. This time, he told um, the angel told the woman, when she asked, he said, Why askest thou after my name, seeing it is secret? He told her, My name is secret. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, but remember, I keep telling y'all, you have to come out of this English and go a little further. Now, we're going to deal with that phrase this time. So this time, you see Lama Zay Tisha Lishmi, it gets an addition to it. So this time, it's Lama Zay Tisha Lishmi Vehu Peli, a Feli. It's Lama Zay Tisha Lishmi Vehu Feli. And what that is, is why do you ask about my name seeing it is secret? So, what we want to do there is look up this word secret. So, <clears throat> this is why I say each time, and I love this principle because it really does line up and confirms everything the New Testament was trying to tell us and show us. And it gives us a picture and shows that our forefathers, fathers and ancestors, they even knew in the Torah that there would be a redeemer and he would be, he would come by way of a virgin. So let's look further. When we see this word secret, in the Strong's, it is H6383. And the word secret, the definition is wonderful. This time, the angel adds something. They, they who? Feli. The messenger or angel revealed that his name <laughs> is wonderful. So, <clears throat> We see the first time when Jacob, Jacob encountered the angel, he asked about his name. He didn't reveal it. He just asked Jacob, um, why do you ask about my name? This time, when Manoach asked, he said unto Manoach, which means what? My name is wonderful. Why do you ask my name? But then he gives him an answer. He said, my name is secret or wonderful. <clears throat> so already you should know where we're going with this. It said the messenger who doesn't <clears throat> want his name revealed is a man first or each angel slash messenger. Then he's called what? God or Elohim. So let's look at this. Genesis 32 and 24, and Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. So we see the man. Now let's go to Judges, the 13th chapter and the 6th verse. Let's see what they say. Then the woman came and told her husband, said, a man of God came unto me, and his countenance were like the countenance of what? An angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was. Neither told me his name. He didn't reveal his name to the woman. But he reveals his name to Manoach. So. The messenger who doesn't want his name to be revealed is what? An angel. We first saw them call him a man. Now they're calling him an angel. Let's see. <clears throat> Let's go to Hosea, the 12th chapter in the third verse, and we're going to read the fourth verse. Hosea 12 and 3 and 4. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Well, he, yea, 
he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found in him Bethel, and there he spake with us. Hosea 12 and 4 said he prevailed, or he had power over the angel. And Judges 13 and 3, let's go back to Judges 13 and 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. So what we see here is the messenger who doesn't want his name revealed also is who? God or Elohim. <clears throat> let's see and let's get more understanding of that. Genesis 32 and 30. And Jacob called the name of the place uh, Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is spared or preserved. Let's go back to Judges 13 and 22. And Manoach said unto his wife, we shall surely die. Why? Because we have seen God. <laughs> Jacob was saying his life was spared. Uh, he named the place uh, Pani, Pani or Pani El because he had seen what the face of God and what? And lived. Now, Manoah is speaking to his wife, telling him we're going to die. Because we have seen God. We've looked at him face to face. So, but what you see here is <clears throat> through J Jacob and through this messenger, we see that Elohim, and we're looking at Elohim from three realms. We're looking at him from being God, the divine realm, being the angel from the angelic realm and man from the human realm. So this angel that's doing all of this, he's going to have all of these attributes. This is not an angel or, or from the Most High's heavenly host. This is somebody whose <clears throat> character and characteristic is totally different from the other Malachims that we know of and read about. So, <clears throat> when we look at it, let's look back at 13 and um, 18. It says, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, What askest thou thus after my name, saying it is wonderful? <clears throat> and that wonderful is the Hebrew 86381. So, it says, for us, I'm sorry, let's go to Isaiah 96, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, Isaiah 96 is going to bring more clarity to who this angel is, or who this man is, or who this Elohim is is it says for unto us Isaiah 96 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about y'all, but all of these threads seem to connect and point us to something where the prophet Isaiah is even going to bring more clarity to the narrative. So, we see that Jacob wrestled with 
this man, this angel, this God, and he asked him his name. And it wasn't time to be revealed yet. Then we see Manoach and his wife. He doesn't reveal his name to Manoach's wife, but he reveals his name to Manoach. And he revealed to Manoach, my name is wonderful. So when we get over to Isaiah 9 and 6, <clears throat> what does Isaiah the sixth, I mean the ninth chapter the sixth verse say his name should be or called? His name should be called Wonderful. So, let's go look at something else in Isaiah. <clears throat> in Isaiah 9, I mean 52 and 7. Isaiah 52 and 7 said, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish, publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Let me read that again with more clarity. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, and bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. So when we get to that good tidings, it's your Hebrew 1319, H1319, and it's Basar. Basar, a primitive root properly to be fresh, that is, full, rosy, figuratively cheerful, to announce glad news. Messenger, preach, publish, show forth, bear, bring, carry, preach, good, to um, tell good tidings. <clears throat> so, when we look at Isaiah 9 and 6, we should see that the person in Isaiah 9 and 6 is the person who is what? Bringing the gospel. The person in Isaiah 9 and 6 proclaimed to Ma Ma uh, Manoach what? His wife, that, that he proclaimed to Manoach and his wife that they would have a child. The person in Isaiah 9 and 6 also is the person Jacob wrestled with. So we see in Isaiah 9 and 6, or the person in Isaiah 9 and 6 is the person who's going to bring the Basar or the Basora or good news or glad tidings. We also see that the person of Isaiah 9 and 6 proclaimed to Manoach and his wife, although she was barren and without child, that she would have a child or they would have a child. The person in Isaiah 9 and 6 is also the person that Jacob wrestled with. So let's go to Isaiah 9 and 7. And this is where things begin to pick up. Isaiah 9 and 7 starts off like this. Of the increase. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, and upon this kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So, what we want to look at here is of the increase. Now, when you're reading this in English, this doesn't show what you should see or show the importance of what you should be getting from this verse, especially from that phrase of the increase, 
because there's something in the Hebrew when you read it. And those that understand Hebrew, the language and the rules of grammar of it, you automatically know it should be pointing the reader to something else. So we're going to deal and look at of the increase. And I'm going to see if I can do something here. Uh -oh. And I hope you guys uh -oh. I'm trying to enlarge something here. And I'm going to see or I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm going to try to show this. I wish I was using somewhere I could screen share. And remember, uh-oh, you ain't going to be able to see this, y'all. Okay. I think you can see this word. That word is Lamar Bay. Lament, Mem Sophie, Resh, Bet, Hey. Lamar Bay. And what you see there, you see the Lament, you see the Mem, you see the Resh, the Bet, the Hey. And let me say it again because I'm in error right here. You see the Lament, the Mem Sophie. You see the lament, mem so feet, resh, bet, and hay. I'm going to say it one more time. Lament, mem so feet, resh, bet, hay. That word is led mar bay. Led mar bay. And you know, Hebrew is read from left to right. I know looking at this, uh, the way I'm doing this, you got the problem saying it right to left. But if you were facing this, computer like I was, it would be from uh, right to left. Hebrew is to be read from right to left, opposite of what we do in our language from left to right. So it would be Lamet, Mem Sophit, Resh, Bet, Hey, Lam or Bay. So, and you'll be able to see it anyway because I'm going to send the documents to those who want it anyway, send the lesson. So, what you see there is, you see the lament, you see the mem so feet, the resh, the bet, the hay. Now, the only problem with this is those who understand Hebrew and understand the rules of grammar when it comes to the Hebrew language, automatically when you see this, you see something out of order that goes against the rules of grammar when it comes to Hebrew. So what we see is we see the mem so feet in the middle of the word. Now I'm going to share something else with you guys and I hope you all can see this. But we're going to get better with our video and stuff so We'll, we're still in the learning phase. So, what you guys are looking at is the letter mem in Hebrew. Now, this one where you see my finger pointing, this is the mem. This is the standard form. And this should always be at the beginning of a Hebrew word that starts with the mem. What you see here, let me see if I do it with the other finger. This is the mem sofit. This is called the final form. And the mem sofit should only be where? At the end of a word. It's the final form. So the mem sofit always should go at the end of a word. It should never be in the middle or beginning of a word like we just saw with uh, Le Marde. So, also, let me get back up. I'm going to read those, what it has up under the uh, mem and the mem feet. Also, when you see this, that mem feet, you see that it's closed. There's no opening in that letter. 
So the memsal feet is always closed. But when it comes to the mem, you see the mem has a opening. It is for a reason. The mem has an opening and the memsal feet is always closed. The mem is the standard form, always goes at the end of a word. I mean, at the uh, beginning of a word. And the mem sophit is the final form, and it should always be at the end of a word. So, like I said, the mem. The mem is the standard form. And the mem is always open. It has an opening. The mem so feet, on the other hand, it's always closed. Let me read this. It's an open mem. Open mem never used at the end of a word. And it is symbolic of an opened womb. I'm going to read that again. Open mem, never used at the end of a word, symbolic of an open womb. Now, with the closed mem, it says, only used at the end of a word, symbolic of of a closed womb. So let's go back and read something. Let's go back. Hold on one second. Let me make this a little bigger so I can read. So let's go back to Isaiah 9 and 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth ever, I mean, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So what we see here, what the writer is trying to project and point the reader of this to is, that this word or phrase, Lamb on the Bay, who Isaiah is speaking of, is going to be coming from, or let me go back one more where we read from. Oh, we said, For unto us a child is born, this child who the government will be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful. And this same child or person is going to what? Publish peace, bring glad tidings or the basura of the good news. When we get to Isaiah 9 and 7, it tells us something that this person is a, of the increase of his government of the increase, and we see Lamarck Bay, and Lamarck Bay should not have a closed mem at the beginning of that word. So what it's telling us is that this person is going to be born of a woman who has a what? A closed womb. It's pointing us to something that this person is going to come from who? A woman or come from a closed womb. This is why you see this memsal feet at the beginning of this word, Lamarck Bay, when it should only be at the end. But you see it at the beginning showing us that this person that is spoken of as Isaiah is going to come from a closed womb. So, 
let's look at this a little further. So, being that we know Hebrew is read from left to right, I mean, I'm tripping, right to left. Let me say it again. When we see Hebrew, we know it's read from right to left. So, with that word, Lamar, maybe we see the Lamed, Mims of Feet, the final form, a closed womb, um, the rest of bed in the hay. And we're going to say this again. Understand this, that the Mims of Feet at the beginning or in the middle of a word is a violation of the Hebrew language. So let's look at this letter mem. And it's very important that when we see this and we understand the letter mem, we pay very close attention to the characteristics of the letter mem. First is the 13th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So we have the open mem. The open mem occurs only at the beginning of a word. Or the middle, I'm sorry. Beginning or the, or the middle. It should never be at the end of a word. The numeric value is 40. The meaning of the letter mem is water, also Mashiach. So, Remember, we said that the open mem represents or symbolic of a open womb. And the closed mem or the mem so feet represents a closed womb. The open mem or the mem in its standard form, it should be at the beginning of a word or the middle, never at the end. The numeric value is 40. It's symbolic of an open womb. So let's look at this again. So the Hebraic thought is when you look at this right here and you look from this direction, it's the picture of a woman's belly. Not only does it symbolize a woman's belly or womb, you see an opening which represents an open womb or you see a birth canal. But when you go to the mem Sophie in its final form, you see a closed mem. You don't see an opening. The womb it represents a womb, but this womb is closed, meaning it has not brought forth children or cannot bring forth children. So, what we see is the mem is made like a belly from above. It has an opening or birth canal with which to give birth. The closed mem cannot give birth. The numeric value of the mem, whether it's open or closed, is 40, which is very important. Why the number 40? The number 40 is the number of weeks when we look at when a woman gives birth, the gestation period of a woman, it's 40 weeks. The numeric value of the mem is 40. So the mem is 40, which is alluded to the 40 weeks in which the embryo is formed in the womb. 
the ancient pictographic word picture for mem is water. Now let's read something. Hebrew mystical thought. The latter mem is not only connected to water, but with the Hebrew word em or mother, or, or as well as a woman's belly or womb from which water flows at the time of birth. Now, in part two of this lesson, all of that there is going to make a whole lot of sense when we go further and deeper into the lesson. But I want to just bring out some hints and clues and get some understanding leading up to that. So we're going to say that again. The mem is made like a belly from above. And this is not something I'm making up. You can um, go study any uh, Hebrew thought or the alphabet, study the mem, study... Um, um, I start to say the uh, the sages. This this thought is even amongst first first century um, writers and teachers in the sages. So this is nothing to make it up. It says the letter mem is made like a belly from above. It has an opening or a birth canal which to give birth. The closed mem cannot give birth. It does not have a birth canal or that opening. It said the numeric value of mem is 40, alluding to the 40 weeks in which an embryo is formed in the womb. The ancient pictographic word picture for mem is water. Then I told you about Hebraic mystical thought. The letter mem is not only connected to water, but with the Hebrew word for maim or mem, we get em, or the word we use in Hebrew for mother or as well as a woman's belly or womb from which water flows at the time of birth. A closed mem represents a closed womb or to a woman who is barren and incapable of giving birth. A virgin has a closed womb until she gives birth to her first child. So let's look at something. When we read the scriptures, <clears throat> it's very important that we understand patterns. Because if we are able to identify something in the scriptures, we're going to see something. Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, Hannah, the wife of Manoach, all had closed wounds. Samuel, Samson, Isaac, and Jacob all came from women or were born of a woman who was barren or had a closed womb. The mother of Hamashiach was a virgin. She had a closed womb. So, that's one to think about. <clears throat> All of these people that we read about in the scripture that were major in scriptures, they all came from women who were what? Who had closed wombs. So we should see a pattern throughout the scriptures. And the next lesson, we're going to look more into that word virgin too. Because that causes a lot of confusion. Uh, <clears throat> and we're going to gain more understanding on the two. The two Hebrew words that are used for virgin. So now let's go to Isaiah 7 and 14. Isaiah 7 and 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son 
and shall call his name Emmanuel, or God with us. And there, my friend, is where I want to end today's teaching. And I would like to say shalom, shalom, fam. Love you guys. And see you at part two of this teaching. Shalom, shalom.